Greetings and welcome to our very exciting finale day. Your support of our event over the past two days has not gone unnoticed. For those of you who missed our first two days, my name is Kaia Brown and I am co-chair of the MLK virtual event. Again, we do have live captioning taking place during our event and the link to follow along alternatively will also be in our chat. Today, we also have the link to our virtual finale brochure, as well as in slide form that I will place in the chat in a little bit. Sponsors will receive a copy of this later today. A big thank you to Monica Lim, Senior Graphic Designer and Instructional Technology Services for her hard work in creating all of our graphics and brochures for all of our events. Some highlights from yesterday include acknowledgement read by Chanel Mason on Wednesday and Skylar Beasley on Thursday. A wonderful student welcome from Africana Studies major, Jameer Ransom, and a welcome from our MLK committee member, Dr. Regina Brandon. We had a Recycle with Flair doll presentation by Deborah Maxey. And again, if you're interested in purchasing a doll that goes to a very wonderful cause, supporting the Diamonds in the Rough students, at Crawford High School, please feel free to contact me. We also had a wonderful piano performance of Beethoven's Tempest Sonata by Mount Everest Academy student, Aaron Chizik. And we also had another powerful film under the leadership of Dr. Niyi Coker, assisted by Rand Alguzian. Today, my profile photo features the beautiful MLK artwork of six-year-old Austin Tellis from Los Angeles, California. And as you can see, all of the profile photos of all of our panelists today include beautiful images of Dr. King. I would like to now introduce Jacob Alvarado Wypuk that will be doing our land acknowledgement. Jacob is a tribal member from San Pascual Cumie and is a part of the Cumie Nation that resides in San Diego, California. His village is called San Pascual or Amokoko in the Kumeyaay language, Apaya, language of the people. The name of his clan is called Waipuk, which means King Snake. He is the inaugural tribal liaison at SDSU and in his third year teaching in American Indian Studies Department, I'm sorry, the Department of American Indian Studies and first year teaching in Child Development, the Child Family and Development Department. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you. And thank you for having me. How could you pay my deep pay chum? No scanner when I took he, but eat by Kumiai, and ya some more for my book, Napoon, Moga Alcabai, Napoon, Nana Tat, Nipon Apache. My name's Jacob, I eat by Kumiai, Mokal Kosh, my pan is my book. My mom's side, on my dad's side, I'm Nipon Apache. I'm honored and privileged to be here today to say the land acknowledgement on behalf of the Department of African Studies and on this uh, special week of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I just feel really good being here and supporting the best way that I can. And um, it's an honor for me. So with that being said, uh, I wanna say the land, the land acknowledgement. We stand upon a land that carries the footsteps of millennia of Kumeyaay people. They are people who traditional life ways intertwine with the worldview of earth and sky and the community of living beings. This land is part of a relationship that has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced the Kumeyaay people to the present day. It is part of a worldview founded in the harmony of the cycles of the sky and the balance and the forces of life. For the Kumeyaay, red and black represent the balance of those forces that provide for harmony within our bodies as well as the world around us. As students, faculty, staff, and alumni of San Diego State University, we acknowledge this legacy from the Kumeyaay. We promote this balance in life as we pursue our goals of knowledge and understanding. We find inspiration in the Kumeyaay spirit to open our minds and hearts. It is the legacy of the red and black. It is land of the Kumeyaay. Yehun, Mahar Feldspin, Nawum. Thank you so much, Jacob. I would like to now introduce our wonderful interpreters for today, Amber Graves and Katura Holiday, 
who have been so amazing to work with. And it's such a joy to have you both here today interpreting for our program. Thank you, Amber and Katura. I will now pass the program along to your esteemed hosts, Dr. Adisa Eyal-Kabilan, Chair of the Department of Africana Studies and also my co-chair of this wonderful event and the lovely Sandra Bullock from the Center for Human Resources. Thank you both for co-hosting today. Thank you. And to you all, welcome to day three of San Diego State University's Department of Africana Studies annual Martin Luther King celebration. Although not physically together, our, spirit, our spirits over the previous two days have definitely drawn us together. We appreciate you joining us in this virtual space. Over the last almost 50, over the last 50 plus years, the image of Martin Luther King has been shaped and molded into an unrecognizable made for television caricature. This Disney-like legacy has presented King as a magical Negro dreaming of a utopian future that can be achieved by appealing to the moral conscience of a country and convincing it that we can all hold hands and sing Negro spirituals together. That fairy tale fails to honor King because it makes no mention of his fundamental belief that only through constant struggle and dismantling the pillars of white supremacy can we begin to create a future and society that all of humanity deserves. By celebrating King once a year and then carrying on with maintaining the status quo is not honoring King or his legacy, but it mocks it and everything he stood for. With our annual celebration of his life and legacy, we always seek to honor, recognize, and educate the community on the true meaning, message, and legacy of Dr. King. We also celebrate Dr. King because of his optimism. He believed that America could be what it always said it was, but only if we continue to struggle to make it so. Although many do not share his optimism, it's still important to honor King and recognize that his confidence in America can serve as a moral guide for a truly just and righteous path to victory. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us for this virtual celebration. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I would also like to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for sharing this event with us on our finale. And I would like to acknowledge our honored guests this evening, SDSU President Adela De La Torre and always Assembly Member Dr. Shirley Weber. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, President Adela de la Torre is unable to join us today, but recognizing the importance of this event, she wanted to share some words with us in this video. To our students, faculty and staff, and to alumni and community members joining us today, welcome to our 41st Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome special guests who are joining us today. Newly appointed California Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber. We appreciate your presence and congratulate you on your new role. We appreciate your ongoing contributions to our regional and state communities. Dr. Catherine Bongoli Medina, who will provide our keynote. Thank you for joining us. While the pandemic prevents us from gathering to march through downtown as we have for decades, our togetherness today is no less important. We can still feel the power that comes with honoring the memory and contributions of the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others whose work helps improve the lives and conditions of black communities. But we live in a time that has ripped open historical traumas and made visible examples of ongoing injustice. It shows exactly how black, brown, and indigenous people are experiencing disproportionate discrimination, and that often as frontline workers, many of them have faced the greatest risk during the pandemic. At the same time, in our streets and parks, in private homes and hotels, events amplify the racism, profiling, and hatred people have experienced in this country for generations and merely because they are being their true and beautiful selves. We honor again the names and lives of those lost to racism and racial injustice. Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Rami Fells, 
and Rhea Milton, and others before and after them. These killings forced our attention on ways the health, economic stability, and freedoms of some have been significantly compromised. Please take a moment of silence with me in memory of those we have lost to COVID-19 and to acts of hatred. By speaking about the pains and acknowledging the contributions of black people, we are not creating a different history. By uplighting members of black communities, we are not undermining the lives of others. By creating space to speak through the experiences and by enriching the lives of black people, we are not treading on the lives of opportunities of others. By working to ensure the safety and well-being of black people, we are not compromising the health of others. We do seek equal justice under the law and the equity for people of color in our society, which our nation has long promised and never fully delivered. In the words of Dr. King, who said in accepting his Nobel Prize, sooner or later, all the people of the world will have to discover a way to live together in peace. If this is to be achieved, man must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Now is a time for changing hearts and changing minds. 2020 was a painful year, but also full of love, compassion, and care. And importantly, the year of the community change agent. Those who stood to serve and protect others. Notably, we saw re-energized movements to improve the economic conditions, education, and health of black communities, including our children. At SDSU, the work of faculty, staff, students, and supporters had led to important changes for our own campus. Those include new programs and funding for students. The Hal Brown Career Learning and Understanding Biases program with a 500,000 gift from San Diego philanthropists, Malin Burnham and Bob Payne. Founded in honor of Hal Brown, a civil rights and economic development leader, the program will further the success of black students in becoming the next generation of community and business leaders. The largest gift ever for SDSU Black Resource Center comes from a San Diego attorney and SDSU alumnus, Stephen Bishop, who pledged a 50,000 matching gift this year. The funding will support a scholarship endowment and a community care fund. New programs are being created to improve training for law enforcement officers, and we introduced a requirement that every student in criminal justice takes a coursework on the lives and experiences of black people and policing. These are a few of the many examples of the progress at SDSU. As someone who is inspired by the work of Dr. King, I thank every single person who spent even a minute of their lives pushing for difficult conversations, pushing back on racist and discriminatory actions and policies, and who nurture community. In the words of Dr. King, who wrote in his 1963 letter from the Birmingham jail, oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. Their yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself. Now, if we were together in person, I would ask you to turn to your neighbor and appreciate them. Not being able to do that in this format, I ask you to take a moment to see yourself, your whole self, your creativity, your intellect, your beauty, your love, your joy. I know you do not hear these words enough. I appreciate you. I respect you. I admire that you are your full self. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Next, we will have the Black National Anthem followed by the libation. Here to sing the Black National Anthem is Melissa Thomas. Melissa is a third year interdisciplinary studies major with a focus in psychology, criminal justice, and sociology. Her calling is working with those society has failed, given up on, or forgotten. The next step for Melissa is to go on to her doctorate in psychology in order to become a criminal or forensic psychologist. 
The libation will be given by our very own Dr. Anta Merritt. Dr. Merritt is a lecturer in the Africana Studies Department here at SDSU. He holds an MA in History and a PhD in Interdisciplinary Studies with a specialization in African and African Diaspora Studies. He graduated magna cum laude from San Diego State University and was an MA Honors graduate from UCSD. His doctoral work was based on field work on the culture and history of Ethiopia with a focus on the community of Afro-Caribbean and African-American people who moved to Ethiopia and had lived there since 1955. Dr. Merritt also has a background in martial arts practice and has created a new course for SDSU focused on the martial arts culture of the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia. Welcome, Melissa Thomas and Dr. Anta Merritt. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the least. Name skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. And now we will have Dr. Anta Merritt. In the African tradition, before every important celebration, a libation of pure water is poured to honor important ancestors, such as our esteemed ancestor, Honorable Dr. Merritt. At every event. As we go through the pouring of the libation, I will, I will say ashe which means so be it in the African language of the Yoruba people. And I ask everyone in call and response manner to also repeat after me, Ashe. I have two containers of water and we'll pass one water container to the other as we say this. We begin. We call upon the divine power within us and the divine power that surrounds us to bless this gathering who gathered today, to celebrate the good life of a great warrior who fought for the civil and human rights of black people and for the global world community as well. And whose philosophy reminds us of the mutual obligation that brings us to each other. Ashe. Ashe. We call upon the presence of ancestor Dr. King and of all our collective ancestors to watch over our shoulders and remind us of our moral obligation to each other and to the perpetuation of human rights everywhere in these challenging days and times. Ashe. And finally, 
in this moment in time, may we deeply remember that we owe much to ancestor Dr. King and to the leadership, to the self-sacrifice and to the courage that he showed us all. Ashe. May we all join in the words akiri, which means it is done to close this libation to honorable ancestor, Dr. Martin Luther King. Akiri. Akiri. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas and Dr. Merritt. Uh, we'll move on to the next part of our program with the African-American alumni uh, chapter and a special presentation with Dr. Demita Myers Miller. She graduated from San Diego State University in 1991 with a bachelor's of arts majoring in political science and a minor in Africana studies. In 1993, an opportunity to teach in the Long Beach Unified School District presented itself and the rest, as they say, is history. Serving as a sixth grade, ninth grade, and 11th grade English teacher, she acquired a master's of education administration and a master's of education curriculum and instruction from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Additionally, she earned a doctorate of education from the University of Southern California. Demita's skill and administrative leadership were recognized by district level leadership. In 2003, she, appointed, she was appointed principal of Lafayette Elementary School and served almost two decades at several Title I sites in LBUSD. Additionally, she supported aspiring and new principals as a coach. Dr. Miller has taught for 10 years as a lecturer for CSULB in their administrative credential and education program and currently in SDSU and LBSD's administrative cohort credential program. Dr. Miller's moral imperative as an educator has always been to serve and provide optimal learning experiences for students of disenfranchised communities of color. Specifically, as a woman of color working in a large K through 12 public urban school district, her daily walk is critical to support, advance, and push the narrative for equity and access and to bring value for students of color. Dr. Demita Myers Miller sees her role as a conduit to bring to life Nelson Mandela's quote, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. This is her hashtag why we do this. Dr. Demita Myers Miller, welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much for that gracious uh, introduction. It is such an honor to be here uh, this afternoon or well, early afternoon. Uh, it is with great privilege um, that I uh, stand with you and celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and um, the legacy of the Africana Studies Department in ensuring that we continue to uplift the um, legacy of Dr. King and all the tenets that uh, he continues to aspire us, especially as we look at um, our national uh, agenda and all the things that we still have to do to support uh, the equality of disenfranchised students and communities. As an alumni of this uh, university, the Africana Studies Department and the courses in which um, I took um, as an undergraduate student helped to frame uh, the base for um, the quote that I embody in my work as an educator. And that simply the function of education is to teach, to think intensively and to uh, think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of a true education. And that is what I believe um, is embodied uh, through uh, Dr. King's legacy and that is embodied by the um, work of the Africana Studies Department. It is here that I bring today um, great news from the Africana um, Alumni Association chapter within San Diego State. And I just wanna share with you a little bit about who we are and what we represent, and also to highlight some really amazing students who um, are receiving some scholarship um, rewards today for their work as students who are continuing to push forward uh, and complete their uh, trajectory as uh, students. 
So the African, uh, uh, African American Alumni Chapter is to pro, uh, be a proactive organization through recruitment, engagement, advocacy, and support to strengthen the relationship between uh, San Diego State University and the African American communities. The African American Alumni Association um, is simply um, an organization that is on its mission to support the current undergraduate students so that we can uplift and ensure that they have a uh, matriculate successfully through the university. Um, the repurpose of the African American alumni chapter has uh, revitalized itself over the last two years, and we have definitely been busy at work. Uh, we have an elected board that is uh, a part in, in collaboration under the guise of the Alumni Association within San Diego State. Our work over the past uh, several years has really been about connecting back to the university and trying to ensure that the alumni are an active voice and active participants to uh, support the narrative of our students. We have worked specifically with our Black Resource Center and Dr. Reddick. We have ensured that we are working uh, to uh, support uh, financial resources for our students. And we are working with the um, uh, Dr. Luke Wood and the um, Diversity Office in trying to uh, develop uh, narratives that specifically support programs and protocols for our undergraduates. Lastly, um, we are actively working on a new project and we are really pushing forward on the renaming project for Dr. Shirley Reber. And with that, I would like to um, call on you to be looking out for news related to that. At this time, we have some deserving students that are on the call today. And I am excited to announce that the AAAC did a funding campaign and pledge that in the homecoming events of 2019, we pledged that we were going to double the amount of resources that we were able to give to students. So in 2019, we were able to give over $7,500 worth of um, Re financial rewards to students. And for the spring 2021, we are able to um, award over $20,000 worth of scholarships uh, to 10 deserving undergraduate students. So I don't know about you, but that deserves a big push because we have really worked hard with um, our alumni base, we have worked hard with the university um, and community members to ensure that we are uh, supporting some of our uh, main focus areas for advancement. At this time, I would like to make announcements for those particular students. As indicated, we are awarding $20,000 worth of scholarships. And we use a financial um, um, base to ensure that the monies that we were distributing were of need. And so with that, there are varying amounts for the students uh, based on the need. Our first award recipient and continued uh, scholar is Alani Abron. She is a business marketing major and her award is $2,175. A continued awardee, Tyree Baker. He is a biochemistry major and his award is $2,175. A continued award recipient, Mabel Morris. She is a psychology major and her award is for $3,267. Our last continued awardee is Isis Venner. She is an interdisciplinary studies major and her award is for $1,675.
So these particular four students received the inaugural award last year and they applied again and were selected as um, needing uh, a scholarship and um, have been awarded. So we are excited for them to continue uh, to be participants in the program, but most importantly, that we are supporting them toward their needs. So big shout out to those four uh, students. Yes. We also have some new awardees, six, uh, that we are going to uh, call out today as well. Sierra Barnes. She is an interdisciplinary studies major and she is receiving an award of $1,500. We have Mohammed Bull, who is an MIS marketing major. He is receiving an award of $2,000. We would like to uh, congratulate Kayla Daniels, who is a history major. She is receiving $2,000 award. Tamil McKee Bay, an Africana studies major, receiving an award of $2,500. We would also like to recognize Kayla McLeod, who is a health communications major, and she is receiving an award of $1,500. And our last recipient, I'm excited about this one because uh, she is a product of LBUSD, so woo woo. Um, and that is Sierra Watkins. She is a theater arts program uh, major, and she is receiving a reci uh, an award of $1,500. So it is with ex ex extreme pleasure that we award these deserving students. They have uh, worked hard um, in all of their um, responses to their application. It was really about what and how will you uh, provide service to your community? And when we think about the words and the legacy of Dr. King, that was what Dr. King was about, is to reach one, teach one, and to give back. And all of these students that are matriculating through the university and these specific awardees really have a call to support their community and really um, uh, ensure that they themselves are a part of what and how um, our uh, communities of color will move forward into this next generation. So on behalf of the African American Alumni Chapter, I just would like once again to thank you for this opportunity uh, to uh, provide um, a narrative of what we are doing as an alumni to support our undergraduate students, but most importantly, to recognize uh, these students and all they have done. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Myers Miller and all of the work that you do with the African American Alumni Chapter. Uh, the AAAC is a very important, is a is a very important, pardon me, is a very important uh, part of the San Diego State University uh, community. And the Department of Africana Studies certainly looks forward uh, to strengthening and continuing our relationship. So thank you. And also congratulations to all of those scholarship recipients. Uh, there are additional scholarship recipients that we would also like uh, to recognize and to assist us in doing that is Christian Holt, uh, the president of the Associated Students. Christian is a senior majoring in kinesiology with an emphasis in pre-physical therapy from uh, Pinole, California. I hope I pronounced that correctly. In addition to working in residential education as a community assistant, Christian's leadership and service include being on the AS Board of Directors, AS Student Diversity Commission, African Student Union, Black Affinity Group, the Black Resource Center, Black Student Science Organization, Campus Curls, Campus Outreach, Collegiate Black Caucus, Help the Homeless SDSU, Jane K. Smith Cap and Gown Chapter of SDSU Mortar Board, National Honor Society, SDSU uh, uh, Rotaract, the Student African American Brotherhood, and Tijuana Home Build SDSU. Christian, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. K. <laughs> Um, I just want to give some short uh, one congratulations to all, all today's scholars. 
Um, this portion of the event is very important because it's honoring scholars and the importance of scholarship. Uh, something I wanted to highlight about Dr. King uh, was that at the age of 17 in 1946, after the lynching of five African Americans in Georgia, uh, he submitted this section to uh, an editorial in the newspaper. Um, and essentially what it says is, we want and are entitled to the basic rights and opportunities of American citizens, the right to earn a living at work for which we are fitted by training and ability, equal opportunities in education, health, recreation, and similar public services, the right to vote, equality before the law, some of the same courtesy and good manners that we ourselves bring to all human relations. I thought it was important to highlight just because, you know, this quote is from 1946, uh, Dr. King, 17 at Morehouse, uh, just really starting his college journey and, and his advocacy journey just sparks after this. Uh, they have a civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, and then a continuation to present day with Black Lives Matter. Um, and, you know, a lot of these things that he's saying are still relevant today. You know, we're still fighting for some of these things today. Uh, so I just thought it was very relevant to Okay, um, uh, Dr. Disa, are you, are, do you want me to take the scholarships? Yes. Okay. Okay, so for the Danny L. Scarborough Memorial Scholarship, uh, that is awarded to Tamil McKebe. And Tamil's right there on the call. Congratulations, Tamil. Okay, uh, for the Shirley Wade Thomas Scholarship, we have Kaneta May, Jameer Ransom, and Akilah Wayne, who have received this scholarship. All right, and for the Gertrude Jokish Endowed Scholarship, we have Suprine, Lloyd. All right. Well, congratulations to our scholarship recipients. Thank you. No, of course. Thanks, Christian. <laughs> it's good seeing your face. Yes, again, congratulations to uh, all of the award recipients. Uh, I am proud of your accomplishments as I, I'm sure your families and communities are uh, as well. So I wish you the best of luck uh, and continued success uh, in your futures. And thank you, Christian. So now we would like uh, to give special acknowledgments. So it's a long list. So please uh, bear with us as we do this because it's very important for uh, these acknowledgments. This event uh, would not be possible with uh, a large team of folks that, that actually makes it possible. So we'll start with our sponsors and they are the Academy of Excellence, Ajinomoto Biopharma Services, Assembly member and soon to be appointed California Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, Associated Students, Aztec Shops, the Black Resource Center, Cal Coast Credit Union, California Faculty Association, College of Engineering, College of Sciences, uh, California State uh, University, EU Chapter 318, Dean's Office of the College of Arts and Letters, Dean's Office of the College of Education, the Dean's Office at the Imperial Valley Campus, the Dean's Office of Professional Studies and Fine Arts, the Department of English, the Department of Women's Studies, Educational Opportunity Programs, Faculty Advancement and Student Success, the Fowler College of Business, uh, International Affairs, John and Lisbeth O'Neill, KPBS, New Student and Parent Programs, Office of the President, Office of the Provost, the Research Foundation, Residential Education, SDSU Alumni Association, Special Education, Student Affairs and Campus Diversity, University Relations and Development, and the USE Credit Union. Our committee is Melissa Boathouse, Dr. Regina Brandon, Dr. Niyi Coker, Dr. Sureshi Jayawardene, Dr. Charles Toombs, 
The webinar and information technology team is also acknowledged. That's James Aquino, Jeff Hornbuckle, and Michael Paschke, Alan Tan, Greg Martin, and Kim Trung Nguyen. Our interpreters, uh, again, Amber Graves and Katura Holiday. And certainly the captioning team, Jennifer Clifford, Elizabeth Crothwaite, Laura Garnellis, John Rizzo, Marie Villarreal, Trish Connery Walkup, and graphics, Monica Limp, and all of our panelists over the last three days. So we will take a five minute break and we will resume our program. So get yourself uh, something to drink, uh, stretch, and in about four minutes and 30 seconds, we will resume the program. Thanks.
Welcome back. I hope this was a good break for you. Uh, but now let's just jump right back into the program. This is one of my favorite aspects of the luncheon, uh, the keynote address. Uh, between the keynote address and lunch, but since my lunch is a sandwich today, this is my favorite part uh, of, of the event. So I have the great honor of uh, introducing our uh, esteemed guests, uh, who I have known for uh, a number of years. She is a friend uh, and a colleague. And she is Dr. Catherine Bancole Medina, a professor of history and distinguished faculty researcher at Coppin State University in Baltimore, Maryland. In 2018-19, Dr. Bancole Medina was awarded a prestigious visiting faculty fellowship at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County and the Drescher Center for the Humanities. She is the author of many scholarly publications, including the, Brown, the groundbreaking text, Slavery and Medicine, Enslavement and Medical Practices in Antebellum, Louisiana, and World to Come, The Baltimore Uprising, Militant Racism and History, which won the 2017 Shekanta Jope Award. Dr. Bankole Medina is the host of the new podcast series, The Invention of Racism, an online mediator for the Coronavirus Race and Health Justice Council. She is currently working on a new book centering medical racism and the African-American experience in medicine. Uh, join me in welcoming uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Catherine Bankole Medina. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is well today. I, my goodness, I am truly honored to be with you today as we celebrate and commemorate the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It is such a privilege to be among the distinguished voices lifting up the spirit of a man who had no equal. I want to thank the historic Department of Africana Studies at San Diego State University. Uh, that wonderful message from President uh, De La Torres, uh, Dr. Adisa Alkebulan, my colleague and my good friend for so many years. Uh, the beautiful Kaya Brown, Ms. Sandra Bullock, and everyone and every office associated with this important event. I want to congratulate the new Dean uh, Dr. Monica Casper, and acknowledge the very special circle of Africana Studies scholars here. I want you to know that I see you, students and colleagues. And I want to issue a warm welcome to Dr. Weber, uh, Dr. Merritt, oh my goodness, so many years. And of course, my good friend, Dr. Nii Coker. I am so humbled. Uh, one of those situations where you kind of feel like you're, you're going to cry, but you know you can't because you have to do a lecture. So, so congratulations, scholars. I, I did want to say something to Dr. Myers Miller. Um, I know a couple of people that I'm going to share the information with uh, about the, the, the scholarships for the students because it is so impressive and so important. So I'm going to get started. I'm gonna give you a kind of outline. I'm going to make a few comments by way of introduction, which references George Orwell's novel, 1984. I am also going to say something about the reductionist challenge to Dr. King's legacy and his place in the black community and propose a critical methodology for engaging Dr. King. Then I will conclude with a few notes on this current moment. Now, I know it sounds like a lot, but I promise that it is my intention to be brief. I am asking for your indulgence because I'm going to read my presentation and I, I'm used to speaking extemporaneously. Most people know that about me uh, and this is what I prefer, but I'm gonna have to read because this is gonna be my fail safe mechanism for ensuring that I pay attention to time. So by way of introduction, four years ago, I gave a Martin Luther King Jr. keynote address in Baltimore, Maryland. The country had a new president and administration 
And let me just say, without going into the details, that many of us were very, very, very concerned. Immediately, I knew that in addition to talking about the meaning of Dr. King's life, I would also have to reference the Orwellian state and that important universal notion that we are all on a quest for freedom. Even then, I understood that referencing 1984 was somewhat derivative, but yet so appropriate. In the discussion of Dr. King's legacy in, 19, in 2017, I drew heavily on George Orwell's work, 1984. The idea of a completely dystopian society where fascism, totalitarianism, and mass surveillance rule, including, of course, the well-known omnipresence of Big Brother. Now, certainly, 1984 seems a bit passe now, but you have to admit, it does make the point. Four years ago, this theme seemed more than accurate. Remember that in the novel 1984, we have the concept of newspeak. And I was particularly interested in this concept because of the ways in which the new administration in 2017 had stunted and reconfigured language. Newspeak in the novel is a degraded form of author authoritarian language. The purpose of Newspeak was to distort language in such a way that you could control how people think, thus giving rise to thought police. And in this story, the act of thinking for oneself was a thought crime, which was illegal. Four years ago, I concluded that for what was coming, encapsulated in the inaugural speech now referred to as American carnage, we would need to study and actualize the words and deeds of Dr. King in order to reaffirm our faith, commitment to struggle, and to enhance our courage. Now, here we are, four years later, with a new president and administration in a new age and at yet another crucial crossroads. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, I didn't think we were gonna make it to today, Friday. I live an hour from Washington, DC. My husband works there. I'm very familiar with the nation's capital. And you saw what I saw on January 6, 2021. There was every reason to believe that more bloodshed was to come in reference to the siege on the US Capitol. Now, if you want to revisit the event, um, and I thank Dr. Al-K Boulan for mentioning it. I did a podcast called White Privilege and the Messy Coup. You can find it in my podcast series, uh, as noted, The Invention of Racism, and it's located on all the platforms. So it is necessary, as with any other pivotal moment in history, to seriously consider what kind of world we want to live in. It is not an abstract question, nor is it too lofty. It is essential for our shared existence. And I want you to know that it's hard for me to focus. It really is. In the United States, over 400,000 people are gone from the coronavirus pandemic in less than a year. And black, brown, and native people are disproportionately affected by the virus. And I know, I know a lot of these lives could have been saved. So, so understand that there is so much more to say about this, about all of this. But in this moment, Dr. King becomes not just an important text, but he emerges as one of the essential texts for our lives. So let me tell you about how I come to know Dr. King. Essentially, we all encounter Dr. King through one particular doorway or another. How were you introduced to his life? For me, Dr. King comes into my life through my family, an African-American family who revered him when he was alive. We discussed him, had his picture on the wall in our home, and on occasion listened to vinyl recordings of his speeches. He was an ancestor whom the people admired especially those in the black church. And I grew up in the black church 
where his image was also hung on the sanctum wall and featured on black funeral home and insurance company hand fans. I understood that Dr. King modeled the best of human values anywhere in the world. Now this does not mean that he was not flawed or complex. We revere him precisely because he was human and only humans can become, can become heroes. What was incredibly significant for me when I was a child was when my uncle, who was also a minister, explained that Dr. King was an intellectual. And this was just pointed out by Christian Holt. I knew him largely as an intellectual. King had received his bachelor's degree in sociology from Morehouse College in 1948 a divinity degree from Crozer Seminary in 1951, and his doctorate in systemic theology from Boston University in 1955. So as a child, I was introduced to Dr. King as a minister and as a scholar and intellectual, someone whom I could aspire to be. And I have to insert here that this is from a family where I was the first person to graduate college None of them had ever uh, attained uh, education past high school. My mother had a GED. Uh, my grandmother, who was the smartest person I knew, had a fifth grade education. So they stressed intellectuality in the children. So for many Black children in my community, this is how we came to know that we could excel in the world and be of service to our people given the restrictions society had placed upon us generation after generation. Now at this juncture, if you want to begin to be grounded in the history of racism in the United States, I suggest that you read and study Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi. And this was published in 20, 2016. Now, turning my attention to the reductionist challenge to Dr. King's legacy, when we talk about Dr. King, as Dr. al K. Boulan has pointed out, it seems that we have detached him from a movement and placed him in a moment, something fleeting. Like you, I understood that King was part of our important civil rights movement, a precursor to Black Lives Matter, and considered one of its leading figures. His movement was rooted in his religious conviction and his command of history. He espoused love, nonviolent civil disobedience, racial equality, and justice. King was a thinker, a philosopher, and a public intellectual, as well as a minister and an activist. And because he was all of these things, he is quotable. This week, all over the world, we quote Martin Luther King Jr. profusely. This is especially so during the period of his birth and death, the months of January and April. Now, quotational practice is very important. Scholars do this as part of the intellectual apparatus of discourse, wrestling with small portions of text in order to find deep meaning. But in the mass popular culture, King is too often a little more than a moment in time, a person quoted out of convenience. Unfortunately, we rarely even deconstruct or contextualize King's quotes. The quote is sufficient to suggest a sense of social justice patronage. Don't get me wrong, quotational practice is very important and his quotes are necessary to remind us of our social justice mission and they are indeed profound. But it is not enough to repeat snippets of Dr. King's words. For those who are seriously engaged in liberatory struggle, we must study his philosophy and ideas. From an Africana studies perspective, Dr. King's legacy has always been that of a fire prophet for a black human rights movement, a servant leader, rather than a mere moment in time. So, in addition to this idea of King as a moment, I am also concerned about the subtle excision of Dr. King from his place within the context of Black community and culture. 
in looking at this, there are countless biographies of Martin Luther King Jr. And some of these books are intended to lift up his memory and others are wholly concerned with tearing it down. You can review for yourself a couple of recently published titles, Michael K. Honey's To the Promised Land, Martin Luther King and the Fight for Economic Justice, and Patrick Parr's The Seminarian, Martin Luther King Jr. Comes of Age. However, one of my favorite accounts of Dr. King's life is Professor David Levering Lewis's book, King, A Biography. I find Dr. Lewis's book published in 1978, when I first read it, to be a well-crafted treatise of Dr. King's life. I was moved by this work when it was first published and over the years, I am still encouraged by this work. And it's true, I've reread it over and over, but just as a note, it has been revised. One of the things that Dr. Lewis talks about is that within 10 years of Dr. King's assassination, the popular culture moved rather quickly to remake his image, to in some ways recraft his public persona, largely to make him palatable to white society. Remember that King was not the darling of white American society by the end of his life. Many believe that he was a troublemaker and that he had overreached when he criticized the country's role in the Vietnam War. And this includes how he analyzed the operations of war and linked it to his deep condemnation of the capitalist infrastructure relative to persistent poverty. Today, we have the liberal messaging of King's I Have a Dream speech. This has been turned into a I Have a Dream persona without clear context. Maintaining the I Have a Dream persona devoid of any discussion of the history of the civil rights movement and structural racism creates a safe, unchallenging public discourse. And unfortunately, when we fail to read and listen to the speech and study the secondary analysis the assertion, I have a dream, is incredibly reductionist. Yet, the other way in which Dr. King is safely and uncritically inserted into the popular culture is as someone who is devoid of community and culture. Dr. King, like Malcolm X, should always be understood and placed within the context of Black community and culture. As a minister, he was part of historic generations of Black clergy from Africa through enslavement up to our time, men and women who spiritually guided and psychically protected Black people. He didn't invent Black oratory. He followed in the Black oral tradition. In Africana studies, we still call this display of Black linguistic authority NOMO, the generative and productive power of the spoken word. King was part of the group of proud black intellectuals. These were men, black men and women, largely disregarded by society at large and excluded from mainstream academia. And they used their knowledge, their skills and their insight to lift up the black community. King belongs to another respected historic group in black society, the educator. His mother was an instructor and he educated the black community from the pulpit, from the jails, in the streets, and planning meetings. Finally, and certainly not least, Dr. King is understood as a black activist whose struggle is centered in the black community and whose words of justice resonated with black communities all over the world. So Dr. King should always be understood and placed within the framework of black community and culture to do otherwise presupposes that he is an anomaly, a racist assumption and diminishes the essential cultural role of black people. With these thoughts in mind, I think we should consider a more respectful methodology for engaging the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in order to engage his legacy in a more meaningful way. We say this every year when we mark the birthday commemorations for Dr. King. We have annual programs, award ceremonies, and a day of service. 
and that his national holiday is marked as a day of service is phenomenal and black community driven, especially since American holidays are mostly concentrated in capitalist consumerism. These King events dismiss this practice and give us hope and momentum in the struggle. But Dr. King's life deserves more. As we recommit to racial justice causes, we need a holistic critical methodology where we as individuals and always in concert with community, read, study, and critically engage the legacy of Dr. King outside of the months of January and April. We need to speak about King's life and legacy with more depth. It is not enough to talk about dreams when we need to also talk about the persecution and surveillance of King and civil rights and political leaders by the FBI. When we need more public discourse on the assassination of Dr. King and coherent distillations of black political prisoners in the wake of the civil rights and black power movements. How can we talk about Dr. King and not speak about his deep desire to end poverty and homelessness and voter suppression and illiteracy and racial discrimination and violence and war? For example, he never understood or countenanced how so many people could be trapped in poverty in a land where a select few others lived in enormous luxury. We are all moved by his, I've been to the mountaintop speech. This is the speech where he muses about mortality and longevity. But I'm here to tell you today, no black man should have visions of his demise at the hands of white supremacists because he wanted to bring, bring peace, justice, and equality to the land. Please understand, Dr. King knew he was going to die. Let me say it again. Dr. King knew he was going to die. Just like George Floyd knew he was going to die. So if you are moved by the I've been to the mountaintop speech, then stand against white supremacy and the violence wrought from white nationalism. And believe it or not, this leads me to my conclusion. We want to know in this new age, what is the relevance of King's legacy? On January 6, 2021, I was ironically working on a syllabus for my course on the history of the United States Constitution. I took a break to see what was going on in the world with the TV muted. And honestly, what I saw didn't make sense. It was a moment where cognition is slow to catch up with perception. But before that, in my mind, every dystopic film I had ever seen unfolded. And then I understood it was an attack, an upheaval, an insurrection, and an insurgency at the nation's capital and at state capitals across the country. They were on high alert. And through it all, rampant global pandemic, killing hundreds of thousands of people, is taking place. I, like you, watched as hordes of mostly white people attempted to alter the, income, the outcome of a legitimate presidential election in the United States. I, like you, watch rioters when not physically battering and battling with police and killing one were treated with great restraint while peaceful Black Lives Matter protesters would be arrested in mass for showing up and doing nothing more than breathing. How can we pay tribute to King's legacy if we don't speak the truth in times like these. Martin Luther King Jr. showed us that there is peace, love, and justice in this world. He believed in human dignity. He helped us to understand that we must struggle for justice, that we have a responsibility to make the nation and our world a better place. There is no freedom without justice. 
there is no humanity without justice. So I'm telling you all today, I'm telling the young people, I'm telling the established scholars, I'm telling the activists, I'm telling everyone here today, don't stop, keep going and keep moving. We are part of a continuum that is nothing less than a beautiful struggle. Martin Luther King Jr. was indeed a great thinker, an eloquent speaker, and an activist. He was willing to risk his life to end racial segregation and bring us closer to justice. Here we have a black man that changed the country without advocating offensive violence, while today others use preemptive violence to signify and solidify racial dominance. We struggle in different ways, it's true. And we all have a contribution to make. Some of us are just joining the struggle, but make no mistake, this is an epic time to be alive. Now is a time for clarity of purpose, depth and breadth of thought, and for foundations of reason and logic. Now is the time for community. Now, maybe we can allow ourselves just one quote by Dr. King that will guide us through these recent events. As he noted in his sermon called Pilgrimage to Nonviolence in 1960, Dr. King said, in spite of the tensions and uncertainties of this period, something profoundly meaningful is taking place. He said, old systems of exploitation and oppression are passing away. New systems of justice and equality are being born. In a real sense, this is a great time to be alive, end quote. So this is not George Orwell's dark and bleak 1984. We are far beyond that now. This is a new age. So like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., use your life to be a beacon of justice for the people. As I have said in the past, and it bears saying again, be energized and inspired. Write, speak, think, organize, smile, protest, march if you must, pray, and have hope. Help somebody whenever you can. Don't wait for a thank you. Just move on to the next mission. And brothers and sisters, have faith. And most of all, have courage. I want to thank you so much for your time and attention. Ashe. Thank you so much, Dr. Benkole Medina. It was uh, wonderful to see you and the words that you uh, offered us were uh, powerful, uh, passionate, uh, and very, very necessary uh, at this time. So thank you. Now I've been given the honor of announcing this year's Unsung Hero Award recipient. The Unsung Hero is selected by the Martin Luther King Committee and is bestowed upon an individual who makes profound contributions to the campus community and most importantly to the educational lives of our students. As a noted, and I would, uh, before continuing, I would uh, like to ask all of the panelists to turn their cameras on. As a noted school psychologist, administrator, author, cultural proficiency expert, podcast host, and personal transformation social change expert on topics related to race and identity, this year's award recipient has over 20 years of proven educational administrative leadership experience in secondary and post-secondary education. She has a PhD from Howard University in psychology and a master's in counseling and education from California State University, East Bay. A native of Oakland, California, she is a woman of passion, vision, and purpose, dedicated to facilitating professional development trainings and workshops in cultural competency, humility, 
social justice and diversity, equity and inclusion, she promotes the art of cultural transformation through her use of humor and straight talk to deliver her consistent message of love, cultural consciousness and racial equality. She created a first minor in cultural proficiency and has been instrumental in educating more than a thousand leaders through the first cultural proficiency certificate program. Her work has not only been recognized in California by colleges and universities and the California State Assembly, but she has also provided diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops for corporations and institutions in New Jersey, Washington, DC, New Orleans, Los, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Sao Paulo and Salvador de Bahia, Brazil. As the president CEO of TKS Consultants, LLC, her Art of Cultural Transformation podcast and online trainings continue to spread the message that cultural transformation carves an entirely new path for positive intercultural relations and aims to create something new that is built upon cultural competency. It has often been said that a butterfly is a transformation and not just a better caterpillar. Cultural transformation only comes with personal transformation. Please join me in congratulating this year's recipient of the Unsung Hero Award, Dr. Tannis King Stark. Oh my goodness, thank you. God bless you all, thank you. Oh my goodness, it's very unexpected. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My gosh, thank you. Thank you so much. You are welcome. You're welcome. Well deserved, Dr. Scott. Well deserved. So deserving. God bless you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so. Thank you so much. It, it means so much. We're Those very proud of you. Very proud of you, Tannis. Very proud of you. Uh, thank you. I couldn't have done it without the love and support, and you all know who you are, and forever you will be in my heart and my soul. I really appreciate my students and all of you. Oh my God. Mm, thank you, Dr. I'm gonna get you. <laughs> all the committee, my gosh, thank you. Oh, it's, it's mm, that's all I can say. Thank you, Sandra, everyone. You know who you are. My students, Camille, uh, every, oh, all of them. Christian, all of them, all of you, just continue to walk in your destiny and stay authentic no matter what, no matter how hard it gets, how tough it may get, how much people may wanna change you, stay authentic to your destiny and to your anointing. Thank you, thank you all so much. Ah. You're welcome and again, uh, thank you. And this is, this is very deserving and it was uh, by unanimous consent of the committee. So thank you for all of your contributions. Miss Sandra. Okay. Oh, let me wipe my eyes before I do anything start going further here. <laughs> I've been crying again. All right. So next we will have a song performance by Corral McFarland Tuet. Corral retired on January 1st after 15 years of teaching in the Department of Chicana, Chicano Studies. She has been a professional singer since 1979, having recorded numerous Latin and jazz albums. Welcome and thank you so much, Corral McFarlane to it. Thank you, I'm honored to be here. And um, I chose this song, I heard it many, many years ago by the great Abby Lincoln. And uh, it's uh, based on, um, it's on a musical Lost in the Stars, and it's based on the novel Cry the Beloved Country. So this is titled Lost in the Stars. Before Lord God made the sea or the land, he held all the stars in the palm of his hand. And they ran through his fingers like grains of sand. 
And one little star fell alone. Then the Lord God hunted through the wide night air for the little lost star in the wind down there. And he stated and promised he'd take special care so it wouldn't get lost no more. Now man don't mind if the stars grow dim and the clouds go over and darken him. As long as the Lord God's watching over him, keeping track how it all goes on. But I've been walking through the night and the day till my eyes grow weary and my head turns gray and sometimes it seems maybe God's gone away forgetting his promise and word he'd say and we're lost out here in the stars little stars big stars blowing through the Beautiful, as usual, Corral. Thank you so much for that lovely song performance. Next, we will have a film presentation called Halle Berry and Tyler Perry Meet New Wigs. And they will, I'm sorry, and this movie is by film presentation, I'm sorry, is by Dr. Nini Coker, Professor Abraham Ampa, Leo Eubank, Ebank, and Haley Simpson. A little about them, well, a lot, sort of. Uh, friend to the department, Dr. Nini Coker Jr., is currently professor and director for the School of Theater, Television, and Film here at San Diego State University. Professor Abraham Ampa is an actor, writer, director, acting coach, casting director, and producer from the Big Apple, New York City. His producing and casting work can be seen in such festival-bound short films such as Valentina, a film by Baby Bird Productions, and The Capo, which stars Grey's Anatomy alumni, Mo Irvin. Mr. Alpha can also be seen acting on hit TV shows such as FX's The People vs. OJ, BET's Boomerang, and CBS's NCIS, and The Young and Restless, to name a few. Currently, Professor Ampa is an adjunct professor at San Diego State University in the School of Theater, Television, and Film. He teaches a course that covers Black theater history from vaudeville minstrelsy to present day and segues into how to create self-devised work. Mr. Ampa holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from NYU Tisch School of the Arts and is a master's candidate in film and media production at the New York Film Academy, Los Angeles. Leo Ebanks is a theater performance emphasis major, born and raised in Miami, Florida, and moved to San Diego in 2018 after serving in the Army. He says, trying to remain motivated through this all is one of the biggest challenges 
but I'm hopeful for what's to come and can't wait for the opportunity to learn, grow, and connect with this new SESU family. And we're glad to have you. Haley Simpson is a senior performance emphasis and has been involved in the acting world for over 20 years across various stages, schools, and productions. Working from behind the scenes to on stage, she strives to expand her knowledge and understanding of the theatrical world as it develops. Her acting credits include Pride and Prejudice, Godspell, Titus Andronicus, Oedipus the King, Romeo and Juliet, Cloud Nine, and more. She currently can be seen representing the show SDSU and the SDSU TTFM department in Cloud Nine. All right, so now let's watch Halle Berry and Tyler Perry meet new wigs. Roll it. All right, so boom, last semester, I had to take this public speaking class for the first time. It was different. Well, the people were. There were some still learning English and others who knew English, but couldn't speak in front of a group to save their lives. I was part of that group. There was absolutely no amount of money you could have paid me to speak in front of people. I don't care what it is. Award speech, eulogy, taking a witness stand in court, I'm good. Anyway, for our final, we have to do a five to 10 minute presentation on racial social justice in America. And this arrogant looking, scrawny ass white boy who never spoke a word, not even so much as to borrow a pencil or anything. Like at first I figured it was just that beginning of the semester anxiety people get sometimes, you know? But after a few weeks, I started leaning heavily towards the fact that he was just racist. So I was like, you know what? It is what it is. He don't bother me, I don't mess with him. Don't start none, won't be none. Well, he went up to do his presentation and no lie, it shocked the hell out of me how knowledgeable he was on this topic. For a second, I thought he knew more about my struggle than me. So after class, I congratulated him on his presentation. Then I asked him, how come he always seems so standoffish and never speaks? He tells me it's because he was scared. So I said, why? Do, do I come off as angry? Please tell me because the places I'm trying to go in life relies on people knowing that I'm approachable as hell. Like, damn, what do we do that makes y'all so afraid of us? His answer to that was because we know. We know. All I could say at the time was, oh, because I ain't know what the hell that meant. But immediately once he left, it hit me. They know, always have. Every time they look at us, they know. They know what we've been through. They know why we're going through it and how we got here in the first place. They just afraid of the win. That moment when we finally say enough is enough. They, they, they know these marches won't work. They know how to have our backs when it's beneficial and marketable for them. They know that if they were in our shoes, this place would have been burned to the ground a long ass time ago. They'd have this whole damn country looking like Tulsa 1921. They know. Couldn't pay white folks a million bucks to trade skin with us. <laughs> Could you blame them?
I, I don't understand. What's happening? You've been hurt, Natalia. Think. Why have we brought you here? I... Uh, um, I, I, I don't know. I was eating dinner when I saw it happening outside. All the lights and stuff, and, but, but I didn't know. I didn't understand. I could hear slurs being thrown every which way outside, so I, I got up and I, I closed the blinds. The news reported a riot happening in my town and I stood up because of the images on TV. So they were calling a new civil war. Oh my god. Think, Natalia. What happened? No. No, 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 no. I don't understand. Play me? There's a chance you can leave us, Natalia. But first, you must assist us in understanding. Why did you let them label you? Why did you let them invalidate you? Why did you think you weren't enough? Think, Natalia. Then, and only then, can we move on. Move on? <laughs> um... When I was in high school, uh, we had two of me, two, two Natalias. One was white and I'm, you know. Instead of them calling me by my middle name, I let them call me Black Natalia. That's how I was defined. I guess my only defining quality was my blackness. I ignored it at the time because I just, I guess, I didn't think it was that big of an issue. Microaggression is real, Natalia. You only survive in this life if you understand that. And make sure you tell them that it's not okay. Your validity is not based on their words. Is there another moment you felt this? My first job was with people just like me, yet every day I could recall de defending my blackness. I kind of spoke up, but I should have done more. I, c I could have, I could have done more. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god, even in elementary school. I let them push me around because my hair was curly. They pet me like a dog because it was so unique and so fluffy. It's okay, Natalia. The only way to move forward is to ex past in today's society, but your own life. Have you seen it? The microaggression? I have, but I don't know how I can stop it, even at work. Hello? 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 Sorry. Uh, that was a very powerful film, uh, as they have been 
the last three days. And I just want to say quickly uh, that Dr. Coker, who is still relatively new to San Diego State University, uh, has been uh, an amazing, he has become an amazing part of the San Diego State uh, community uh, and has enhanced, uh, just his presence has, you know, just enhanced uh, everything that we do uh, on this campus. So uh, thank you for all of the hard work that you and your students put into uh, creating uh, these films. And I think this is the third year uh, your students' films uh, have been a part of uh, the luncheon. So thank you. So now I will offer our closing remarks. We've come to the end of our program. And after the closing remarks, uh, you know, we will have our benediction as well as a special musical presentation. Uh, so be sure to, to wait for the musical uh, presentation. Our beloved Dr. Martin Luther King Jr was hated by the liberal press and the liberals in government. We get it twisted when we assume that his enemies were limited to conservatives and Republicans. And if we're being honest, a lot of black folks had grown very weary of his politics, but for decidedly different reasons. Nevertheless, Dr. King understood that racial justice was not possible without economic justice. The last three years of his life, he spoke less and less about civil rights and more and more about economic justice. In 1963, he was lamenting about freedom highlighted by civil rights and integration. By 1968, he was fighting for human rights and dignity and making demands on an international system that violently exploited the labor of the global masses. His Poor People's Campaign was a call to action to wage war on poverty rather than war in Vietnam. He also recognized that the same forces who were oppressing working class Americans were also sending young, undereducated and underprivileged working class Americans to Vietnam to kill other working class people. This was an unpopular position. It was a radical position that cost him dearly, but he unapologetically took that radical position. 168 newspapers, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, condemned him for it. They told him to stay in his lane. They told him that his critique was giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Does that sound familiar? His Beyond Vietnam speech remains one of the most powerful and passionate cries for peace, human rights, and human dignity. For those of us who truly honor King, who will give a Beyond Afghanistan speech? or beyond Iraq speech, or beyond Yemen, or beyond Syria, or beyond Palestine, or beyond Ferguson. It's easy to clutch our pearls and condemn the twice impeached former occupant of the White House, but the real fight is challenging the system that created him, has normalized war, a system that created the necessity for a civil rights movement, a Black Power movement, a Black Lives Matter movement, and a system that created the deplorable, inhumane humanita humanitarian crisis at the US border. If we are to truly honor King, we will honor him with our radical action. Simply worshiping the new regime, regime ain't it. It must also be pushed and held accountable to the people. It is up to us to do the work. King helped to lay the foundation now let us stand on his shoulders and continue that work. Thank you so much for joining us this year and we're looking forward to celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on our beloved campus next year. We also hope that you join the Department of Africana Studies as we celebrate our 50 year anniversary in 2022. More information on that is forthcoming. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Ms. Sandra. Okay, now for the benediction. Here to give the benediction is Kyle Aaron. He, Kyle is a graduate from the Africana Studies Department here at San Diego State University, and he currently works for a Christian ministry that focuses on helping college students become Christ-centered leaders for the renewal of the world. Kyle's particular target is reaching out to the Black community. Kyle and his beautiful bride, Cassie, Enjoy cheering on the Aztecs at sporting events, 
cooking good food, my count me in for that Kyle, and taking long walks with their many golden doodles. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you. Um, so glad to be here with y'all. Uh, I'm sure uh, y'all are over Zoom, so I will make this really quickly. Um, I just, I love Dr. Alcabon's closing remarks uh, about just the, the things that Dr. King was about, um, and even the, the keynote speech of uh, Dr. Medina. And I just can't, I can't help but think about the, the analogy and the imagery that King used uh, throughout his life of the Exodus. And so uh, when it comes to this benediction, I couldn't help uh, but think of a passage from that, from the book Exodus in, in a time where it seems like we're in an unending uh, pandemic. It feels like no one sees us. It feels like no one hears us. It feels like there's no end to the struggle. Um, as many people have remarked on the struggles that have happened over the past year. And so let me just read this in terms of benediction, uh, and, and I hope that y'all internalize this. And so Exodus 3, it says, And the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. And so as y'all are exhausted, as you're worn out, as you're tired, just know that, hear that, that there, there is someone, there's a God who knows you and sees you and is coming to your aid. And so that is my word of benediction. I hope y'all are well uh, and keep fighting on because as Dr. al is saying, the fight is not over. Thank you, Kyle. And just briefly, Kyle was one of my uh, favorite students uh, when he was uh, at San Diego State University. Uh, in any event, uh, to close out our program, we have a very special musical uh, presentation. Uh, this song has special significance in the African-American community. Uh, and the song has come to mean so much more than you know Martin Luther King. Uh, however, I'm going to bring the song uh, back home. And this song is Happy Birthday uh, by Stevie Wonder. Uh, and this song was, was uh, made to honor the life and legacy uh, of Martin Luther King. So as we close out the program, uh, enjoy. Oh, no way. 
Thank you so, so much, everyone, for a wonderful three days. We enjoyed having you with us, and we look forward to an in-person event next year. Thank you so much for all the support.